George, good to have you back on. It's been about six months since we had an update from you on the lithium market. Um, just to start things off, how's the market performed since we last spoke? Yeah, hey Peter, thanks for having me on again. Um, yeah, I, I suppose it really slightly depends on, on how you define performing. I think on, on one hand, prices have gone up by about 350% since we last talked in the lithium market, um, which is obviously quite a huge price move and, and has definitely pushed lithium pricing well beyond pricing required to incentivize new investment and expansions from all the current lithium incumbents and also encourage juniors to join the market and develop their projects. But on the other hand, I think this kind of extreme volatility in pricing has been quite painful for certain producers and consumers in the market, depending on their purchase agreements. Um, notably, the market has also certainly been maturing in terms of contract structure and interest from the financial sector as well. Um, so that's been uh, good too. Good. And what's been the main drivers around this 350% price increase? I think that's probably something we should probably touch on first. Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, incremental new supply planned to come to the market during 2022 um, against a backdrop of exceptional demand for electric vehicles has really been the driving force of the price increase, um, which has led us to a point where there's severely limited availability um, for anyone without a lithium supply contract signed last year or a long-term relationship with an incumbent producer. And how does that impact your demand forecast moving forward? Have a, is this just a short-term issue that, that we're looking at or, or is this is this going to go on for a bit longer than, than, than anticipated? Yeah, I, I think these, these high prices are going to last for a while longer. Um, we, we've been seeing a lot more investment as a result of this into lithium juniors and exploration stage companies. Um, with actually $3.7 billion in acquisitions, joint ventures, and capital raising seen in Q4 last year. And this is improving the probability of some of these assets to come to market in the longer term future. But ultimately, the supply demand dynamics in the near term are looking relatively similar. I think prior to this point, um, the forecasted price increase as a result of these market dynamics was, was pretty evident in the numbers. And rising prices have yet to drive um, structural change in the market, with hard rock projects still taking three to five years to come to the market in the best case, and Brian taking five to seven years to come to the market in the best case. I think in the near term as well, we've seen some smaller delays in projects and expansions under development. Um, they are currently facing higher costs and labor shortages as a result of inflation and, and a bit of a boom across the commodity space. Um, the continued impact of COVID cases and restrictions is also an issue there in developing of assets. Can you just remind everyone uh, what the sort of breakdown is at the moment in terms of lithium production that, that is intended for battery use? So things that I eventually turn into a hydroxide, essentially. Sure. Um, yeah, this one really depends at what stage of the supply chain you're looking at. Um, in terms of extracting or mining um, lithium from the ground, 30% uh, of the world supply comes from Chile, 15% uh, of world supply comes from China, around 45% from Australia, and then 5% from Argentina, uh, and around 5% from the rest of the world. Um, just looking at battery-grade chemicals, however, you know, over half of the world supply would be uh, based within China, uh, and the rest kind of based either in or near the other producing jurisdictions. Just to touch on China very briefly, um, obviously with all the lockdowns going on there at the moment, um, are we starting to see an impact on the processing capabilities in the area there? Yeah, it has potential to reduce um, utilisation rates at, at chemical refining facilities. Um, it's kind of been a recent development in the market, so we'll have to see how that goes, but there's certainly potential for an impact there, absolutely. And uh, looking outside of the, sort of, I guess, more broadly at the EV market, um, with nickel prices reaching over 100,000, obviously it was only for a day or two until the markets reopened, but still staying at very high prices. We see graphite ticking up quite nicely. Lithium has increased dramatically. I guess one of the questions that a lot of speculators in the industry are trying to trying to figure out at the moment is, are we sort of pricing ourselves out of EVs? And is it just going to become uh, unaffordable for ordinary people to really get behind this movement? So if, if that is the case, are we likely to see um, an increase in forecast for things like hybrid and pet or, or even just normal petrol and diesel vehicles moving forward? Have, have those forecasts changed at all? Yeah, this is, this is a really interesting question. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're not really seeing that despite prices having been on the up for the past year or so, in that battery electric vehicles are taking up about two thirds 
uh, or more of the electric vehicle market share globally at the moment. Uh, I think whilst hybrids do make up part of the, the solution um, to the energy transition in the near term, in the long term, if we're to meet emissions targets, hybrids won't really get the world or automakers there. Um, I'd also argue that as a consumer, you don't really get the full benefits of an EV with a hybrid um, because you still have an engine that you need to service compared to very little maintenance costs associated with a battery electric vehicle, um, as well as zero tailpipe emissions, which I think favors the uptake of battery electric vehicles, uh, in my opinion. Um, and then whilst raw material price increases will kind of inevitably increase the cost of cell production, um, that may have some impact, but I think in reality, it's important to recognize that most automakers aren't actually paying these $70,000 per ton spot prices for their lithium. Um, and as such, the impact of raw material prices on the cost of the battery should be able to be shouldered by OEMs and the consumer, um, especially given increased uh, consumer acceptance over the past year. I also think um, the lithium price rises have yet could see the kind of cost of battery production rise by around $1,000 to $2,500 per vehicle, depending on the individual value chain. I think compared to uh, a kind of an average electric vehicle sticker price um, and you know, taking into account savings on maintenance, et cetera, it, it really shouldn't be too damaging, um, but we'll have to see how that plays out against subsidies and, and how much the automaker is willing to absorb. Um, I'd also argue that you know, with oil and gas prices on the rise on the other side of the equation, as well as uh, some questions over reliance on Russian fossil fuels in, in Europe and globally, I think there could be some cost inflation and a push and flat push factor away from hybrids on that side. Um, so I'm not sure there'll be much impact on the success of, of battery electric vehicles. In terms of the, where the price is at the moment and, and the trajectory it's, uh, trajectory it's going on, um, do you think we drew a correction anytime soon? Yeah, in my opinion, no. Um, you know, there's simply not enough lithium being produced in the world at the moment to cater for the lithium iron growth story. Um, and whilst price volatility, you know, is perhaps overegged by kind of anxious sentiment in the market, there's no fundamental reason that I can see on the supply or demand side for prices to fall in the near term. I think all right, it's a good market to be in. George, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for coming back on and, and giving us an update. Thanks, Peter.